This is Glass City Humanist, a show about humanism, humanist values, by a humanist. Here is your host, Douglas Berger. In this episode, we find out that even humanists have concerns about people we honor as humanists of the year, and that's a good thing. Then I talk about the recent report released by the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and the Freedom from Religion Foundation about the connection of Christian nationalism to the January 6th insurrection. Glass City Humanist is an outreach project of the Secular Humanists of Western Lake Erie, building community through compassion and reason for a better tomorrow. In recent years, activists and others have been forcing our government, both federal and local, to reconsider people and events of the past that have been honored in light of current ideas about social justice. For example, black activists got the state of South Carolina to stop flying the Confederate flag outside their state house. Other people supporting social justice finally were able to get statues of traitors who fought for the Confederacy removed from public squares and parks. And other activists have convinced school boards to not name schools located in minority neighborhoods after historical figures who owned slaves. I totally support removing those types of honors. The Confederates lost the war. Why should we honor any Confederate? They're traitors. Removing those honors doesn't change history. The South still lost the war. And you have to ask yourself, why don't we have a Fort Grant? anywhere in this country. There are quite a few military installations that are named for Confederate generals, such as Fort Bragg, but none for the guy who ultimately defeated the South, Ulysses S. Grant. These social justice actions are the result of evolving thought on how we treat people. Back in the day, little to no thought was given about putting up a monument to the Confederacy on a street corner in Ohio or naming a school after the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Today, we try to be more thoughtful, even as we pull some people kicking and screaming along the way. The humanist movement also has skeletons in its closet. You may have heard about the American Humanist Association rescinding uh, the Humanist of the Year Award from Dr. Richard Dawkins and Dr. Lawrence Krauss. Uh, Dawkins' award was removed due to his controversial comments disparaging women, social justice, and trans people on Twitter and other social media outlets. Krauss's award was rescinded due to his continuing issues with women and personal boundaries. The Humanist of the Year Award is the premier recognition by the AHA, and it's usually given out during their conferences. On the webpage listing all the awardees, as well as people that have been awarded other recognitions from the various AHA adjuncts, it gives a short description of the award. The Humanist of the Year Award was established in 1953 to recognize a person of national or international reputation who, through the application of humanist values, has made a significant contribution to the improvement of the human condition. Selection of the awardee is based on research derived from biographical data writings, studies, and contributions to humanity. Nominations are accepted from the AHA members and considered by the AHA Board Awards Committee. With that in mind, the other day, I was working on some social media graphics to highlight some African Americans who either were AHA Humanist of the Year or who had been given another award like the Humanist Heroine Award. Um, I didn't find them directly online and I really didn't want to copy somebody else's work, so I decided to create my own. So I went to the the list of awardees on their website, and many of the names, I didn't know who they were, believe it or not. (laughs) I didn't know who all of them were. So I looked them up online using the regular uh, websites like Wikipedia, and I did a general Google search if they didn't have a Wikipedia page. Um, And I came across some people who were given awards back in the day that would never be honored by the AHA in 2022. For example, old letters from uh, biologist E.O. Wilson, who was the 1999 
Humanist of the Year. He passed away in December of 2021. His letters were given to the Library of Congress recently, and a lot of the and researchers went through and found that a lot of the content showed that Wilson held some extreme racist beliefs and supported scientists who were known to advance racist agendas. 2006 awardee Steven Pinker has some issues with being linked to uh, the uh, convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein and continues making controversial negative comments about social justice on social media and in interviews. Now, I, I have been so disappointed with Steven Pinker and I believe he is such a poor person to honor that I have directed my group to refuse to promote his work or support him in any way. And then we have Margaret Sanger, who was the Humanist of the Year in 1957, and she is well known to have supported the eugenics movement for population control back in the 20s and 30s. If you're not familiar with eugenics, that's where uh, people arbitrarily decided whether or not certain individuals could procreate. And they used uh, uh, state enforced sterilization and other means that were wholly anti-democratic, uh, violated the due process of people, um, and unnecessarily subjected a lot of people to a lot of hurt and stress. And it's been rejected. Eugenics is no longer uh, a, a policy that anybody, any humanist, any rational humanist supports. Then we have Dr. Ben Munson. He was given the Humanist Heroin Award in 1984 for performing illegal abortions in South Dakota before 1973 when Roe v. Wade was decided. In fact, he was the only doctor in South Dakota at the time that would perform abortions, even though they were still illegal. And then after, even after Roe v. Wade was decided, he was put on trial for sending home a woman with an incomplete abortion who later died. Robin Morgan, who was awarded the Humanist Heroin Award in 2007, had some real nasty comments about a trans woman in a keynote speech at the West Coast Lesbian Conference in 1973. The trans woman who was the target of her harassment and comments was the woman who organized the event. And I'm just, I was reading about it and it just shocked me. But yet we gave her the Humanist Heroin Award in 2007 for all her work that she did besides that. And I personally observed the 2001 Humanist Heroine, Diane Russell, use her acceptance speech time to personally attack that year's Humanist Pioneer awardee, Wendy Kaminer, over Kaminer's longtime support of pornography. Uh, Russell was very, very anti-pornography, and she used her time to personally attack Wendy Kaminer because Kaminer supported pornography. Now, I didn't do a comprehensive check of all the awardees on the list. Um, I spent a few hours going through ones, uh, but hopefully you get the picture. Uh, some of the humanist of the year that we gave humanists of the year to uh, probably would not be honored today. And while I supported the rescinding of the award from Dawkins and Krauss, I don't necessarily support rescinding awards as a first principle. Many of the people have passed away, and to be honest, some of their thinking back in the day was cutting edge. But then, it, but then it's become rejected now. There was a uh, psychiatrist uh, named uh, Thomas Sass, who was awarded a Humanist of the Year Award in 1973. And his study, or well, his claim to fame, was that he believed that mental illness didn't exist. He believed it was a metaphor for uh, describing uh, how a person was living at that time. 
So what that meant, you know, and that was just totally radical in 1973. And it's now nobody follows that anymore. Uh, that is not, you know, mental health is a disease. It does exist. And there are treatments for it. And simply uh, addressing somebody's life or how they're living isn't going to solve mental illness in most cases. So that just gives you kind of an example. I don't totally agree with judging a body of work uh, from history with 2022 eyes. Uh, that doesn't mean I won't, but it, I mean, you're a little bit uh, walking a fine line. In fact, the AHA makes a point about uh, pointing out hindsight judging on that awardees page. And they write on the page, the Humanist of the Year Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award recognize the accomplishments and work of the individuals reflecting humanist values up to the date of the award and in concert with the prevailing humanist thought of the time. Since humanism is an evolving philosophy where we continually strive for improvement, some awardees we recognize in the past would no longer meet our current standards. As humanists, we also recognize that people are imperfect and may at times lose sight of the values and ethics that previously guided their humanistic behavior. I, and I'm, I'm so pleased to see that noted because they didn't need to put that on there. But I'm sure, you know, after Krauss and Dawkins lost their uh, award and they probably got some people, probably like me, that looked up other people and said, hey, what's he doing on there? But, you know, it's more of a historical record rather than current thought, just like the manifestos. You know, we have three manifestos now, and Manifesto 3, also called the Aspirations, that's current humanist thinking. That has supplanted Humanist Manifesto 1 and 2. That doesn't take away from what 1 and 2 said, or the people that signed them, but the current Manifesto 3 is the current uh, consensus of humanism. So that's how that works. Um, another way of thinking about it is when I was a kid, um, uh, many, many, many moons ago, <laughs> back, back in the old days, uh, we had a playground that I played at regularly. It was uh, near the Riverside Park in Finley. And it had uh, concrete sewer tile that you could crawl on and around, all right? Concrete sewer tile just set on the ground that kids could run around and go in and climb on, okay? We had a kind of thing that looked like a fort, but it was made of metal, metal piping, and uh, the sides had metal plates. Uh, there was diamond plate treads on the stairs and a roller slide so it was like if you go into like a speedway or a gas station they have those hot dogs on the machine that's what this slide looked like okay we had that and we also had a very tall metal slide now most kids today don't get to enjoy sliding down a metal slide in the middle of August with the blazing sun out, very, very hot, <laughs> you know, and there was no padding on the ground. It was just dirt, just compacted dirt from all the kids. You know, there wasn't any rounded corners, exposed bolts weren't taken care of. Uh, oh, it was just, and, and you wonder how we survived. Well, now, a days in 2022, when people build playgrounds, now they are more co they they think more about the safety of the children. So they might put mulch down or rubber pellets or something on the ground. Uh, they'll use plastic more often than metal. 
the slides aren't baked in the sun and hot. They still are warm, but they're not hot now. And if you have a Ford, it's made out of wood and the exposed bolts are, are dealt with or cut away or hidden or capped or, you know, and, and you would not have concrete, uh, uh, concrete sewer tile to climb on. You know, and in fact, I think at the park that I used to go to, they took that out, you know, several years ago because it was just a way of getting hurt. <laughs> you were just trying to find a way of getting hurt. And that's the way the thinking evolved. And that's how the thinking evolved with the humans of the year is that somebody that won it in 1952 probably would not be awarded in 2022. That doesn't mean the person that won it or was awarded it in 1952 is any less of an honoree. It's just that at that point in time, they were sliced bread, put it, <laughs> put it that way. They, they were sliced bread. Now they're not. Now, however, I do think there are some red lines we shouldn't cross when giving awards like the humans of the year. Racism is one. Anybody with any history of racism or bigotry, they should be disqualified. Misogyny is another. That's why Dawkins kind of lost his award is because he disparaged women constantly on social media. I think if a humanist in 2022 still supports eugenics, that should d disqualify them. And I also think that if a potential awardee rejects or gives short shrift to social justice and social justice issues, then they shouldn't be considered because that's where we're going. We're going towards social justice. We're going to anti-racism, um, anti-bigotry. That's where we're headed. Since the Humanist of the Year Award is up to the board of the AHA, they could vote to rescind an award at any time, and I'm fine with that. I think the group should have the ultimate control on who it honors and who it doesn't. It's also good to know that people whose ideas or work was honored in the 1950s turned out to be wrong in 2022 and that we don't hide it. That shows that our principles and values can change when we gain new information or insight. And that just proves the humanist philosophy. I did enjoy reading some of these biographies of the awardees who I really didn't know before I started my project. And I would, would really like to see the AHA revise the awardee page and include some bio, biographical information, maybe the reason the person was awarded or honored at that time, or like they've done recently with recent awardees include links to the acceptance speeches published in the Humanist Magazine or in other repositories if they have them available. We shouldn't avoid honoring people who do good work, but we should make sure that there won't be any surprises in the future. Do you like what you hear? Would you like to support the show so we can make it better? You can write a review for podcast apps that allow reviews. You can share our website, glasscityhumanist.show, with your friends, and you can donate to the show using the donate link on the website. Any support is appreciated. Christian nationalism is a serious threat, not only to religious freedom in this country, but it's a threat to our democracy. Christian nationalism is at the foundation of the forces that attempted the coup on January the 6th, 2021, when they attempted to overturn the election of President Biden and attack the Capitol building. The Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty sponsored a report along with the Freedom From Religion Foundation titled Christian Nationalism in the January 6, 2021 Insurrection. It was released on February the 9th. The report details Christian nationalist rhetoric and symbols that cropped up at events that preceded the insurrection and at the event itself. When we talk about Christian nationalism, 
we aren't talking about your neighbors attending church on Sunday, giving food to the food bank and, and stuff like that. We're not talking about Ma and Pa Christian uh, praying and reading the Bible, having Bible studies and things like that. Christian nationalists believe that the U.S. is meant to be a Christian nation and want to take back the U.S. for God. Experts say that Christian associated support for right wing politicians, such as Donald Trump, and social policies such as legislation related to immigration, gun control, and poverty is best understood as Christian nationalism rather than as evangelicalism. The f and try to give you a summary of what Christian nationalists believe. They believe that the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation. The federal government should advocate Christian values. The federal government should not enforce the strict separation of church and state. The federal government should allow religious symbols in public spaces. If you follow, at least here in Ohio, the U.S. Senate race, uh, we do have a candidate who espouses a lot of those things, those phrasings, especially about allowing prayer in the public schools. Uh, um, not going to name him. But um, he used to be uh, uh, the state treasurer, and now he's trying to get to be on the U.S. Senate. And he's, he's said a lot of these things. Um, he's been campaigning at, uh, at uh, uh, religious conservative churches around the state. And um, yeah, so it's, it exists here in Ohio as well. Uh, Christian nationalism in the United States is all about supporting white supremacy. And that is why many white supremacists can be found as pastors in churches spouting off against secular government. For example, in the report, author a Andrew Seidel, Director of Strategic Response for the Freedom of Religion Foundation, writes that Christian nationalist symbols and references were ambiguous at, at the gatherings, the, the pre insurrection and the insurrection gatherings, as well as at the insurrection itself. Flags with superimposed American flags over Christian symbols, an appeal to heaven banners, prayers recited by members of the extremist group Proud Boys shortly before the attack, or by others as they stormed the Capitol. And if you saw the video of the attack, you would have seen many of those symbols. Speaking to reporters on Wednesday, that was uh, February the 9th, Seidel highlighted what he called the preponderance of openly militant rhetoric that conflated religion and violence. He pointed to William McCall Calhoun Jr., a Georgia lawyer who reportedly claimed on social media that he was among those who kicked in Nancy Pelosi's office door on January the 6th. Calhoun later claimed in an interview with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that he did not personally enter any office. God is on Trump's side. God is not on the Democrat side, Calhoun allegedly wrote in a social media post. And if patriots have to kill 60 million of these communists, it is God's will. Think ethnic cleansing, but it's anti-communist cleansing. Whoa. Some people will hear this information and ignore the implications, since it possibly doesn't have directly affect you? Yet, there are some places, like in Tennessee, just this past few weeks where there have been book burnings. They've been pulling uh, books that they didn't like out of public school libraries and, and public libraries and burning them. Whole states have outlawed the discussion of racism in public schools. Ohio's considering such a, a law. In other places, right-wingers are trying to take over state election systems to make overturning results they don't like easier. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled during the pandemic that church services are essential, and so they should be exempt from lockdowns. And they are currently looking at a case about a city refusing to fly the Christian flag on a pole in front of City Hall. Several justices seem sympathetic to the group wanting to fly their flag. Christian nationalism seems to be at the root of all of these things, and if it isn't stopped, it will be bad for secular people, 
and it will be bad for people who become victims of white supremacy. Um, I also, uh, just, I didn't participate, but I was there during the press conference. Uh, it was a webinar. It was online when they presented this paper. And, uh, so I put a link to the, the paper and a link to a article from the religious news, uh, service, uh, so you could check it out. But I, I really would encourage people to, uh, check this out, check out the report and read it and, and see these examples. I mean, this stuff is going on now. Um, I don't want to hype it as if there's no possible way of getting around it. It's just, it's a very disheartening, uh, you know, we've come so far with real religious freedom and it looks like we're going to take a massive step back. And it's going to start with these Christian nationalists that pack the courts and are in our state legislature and in Congress. And they're going to, it, they're going to roll back the clock on a lot of these rights and, and protections that we've enjoyed as secular people. And we need to get on board. We need to get on the same page. So I, I put a link to the report and to some other reportage on this issue. And I really strongly advise you to t check it out and, and really keep up on this issue and respond in kind when needed. Um, I know our group, the Secular Humanists of Western Lake Erie, you know, I'll make sure I send out alerts if we need alerts. Uh, especially if something's going on locally or in the state. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a bumpy ride. It, it, it does. It's going to be a bumpy ride. We're going to see how that January 6th committee turns out. Um, and hopefully we're able to get through this and, and have our democracy survive. I really do. Thank you for listening. For information about the topics in this episode, please visit the episode page at glasscityhumanist.show. Glass City Humanist is an outreach of the Secular Humanists of Western Lake Erie and is supported in part by a grant by the American Humanist Association. The AJ can be reached at AmericanHumanist.org. Sholey can be reached at HumanistsWLE.org. Glass City Humanist is hosted, written, and produced by Douglas Berger, and he is solely responsible for the content. Our theme music is Glass City Jam, composed using the Amplify Studio. See you next time! <laughs>